it is today our guest today is Jillian Butler Brown that is going to uh, talk about muscle and aging and Jillian began working on muscle at the Pasteur Institute in 1978 in the laboratory of Francois Gros and was recruited to INSERM in 83, where she was the first to describe the different, different uh, isoforms of myosin heavy and white chain and white chains that were expressed during muscle development. In 86, she set up her independent group in Paris Five Medical School. Since then, she has worked on various aspects of human muscle development, uh, aging and physiopathology. In 96, she moved to the medical school on the Paris 6 campus. From 2009 to 2013, she co-directed and then from 2014 directed the Center for Research in Myology until she retired in 2019. And she coordinated Myo H, Understanding and Combating Age-Related Muscle Weakness, a large collaborative network of 19 um, um, participants in a European frame, uh, Framework uh, 7, FP7 uh, project. Thank you, uh, Julian. So teachers ought to stay young forever as yourself. Ah, I'd like to do that. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about muscle and aging. And I've organized a very general seminar because I don't know who my audience is. And so, and, and a lot of this seminar is based, in fact, on the uh, MyoAge project that we had, um, which was to look at uh, healthy aging, healthy muscle aging. So as you all know, in fact, what we're looking at, even if you're in very good health, you're all going to get older. And one of the, and so the different aspects of aging, as some of us like myself are getting into, whereas others of you are, are much younger, as you age, you'll find that your muscles decrease in mass. And this, since there's a crosstalk between the muscle and the bone, there's also a decrease in bone mass with age. This decrease in muscle and bone is, is followed by, is compensated also by an increase in fat mass. During aging, you'll have a decrease in the immune system, uh, a decrease in memory, metabolism, circulating hormones, a decrease in growth factors, and an increase in inflammation. And all of this is during the natural process of healthy aging, it's physiological. And this process, in fact, starts very early because from 40 years onwards, you begin losing muscle mass. And you, you, you lose between 40 and 70 years about 8% of your muscle mass per decade. And from 70 years onwards, this muscle mass gets, uh, you lose it much quicker and you're losing 15% of the muscle mass between 70 years and 100 if you get there. So, if you want to look at it, you can you find that you can either age well or you can age badly. And if you age badly, then you can get to this state of critical sarcopenia. When you get decreased, you lose the mobility. And muscle mass is really important because it's not only there to help you move, you can do all your movements, but it's also there for maintaining metabolism, energy production, and keeping heat and homeostasis of the body. There's a cross talk between all of the systems. So if, you if you're going to lose your muscle mass, and as you can see, it's very inevitable that if you're in a sedentary, uh, sedentary normal situation, there's a gradual increase, decrease in age. But if you look at, if you can do active exercise, as uh, Antonio said, looking for the, the elixir of life, we find that you can actually maintain muscle mass. And if you look at the, elite sports uh, people, people who are doing swimming out into their 90s, who are doing marathons, they actually managed to maintain their muscle mass. As you can see, it began early. And we also know that this muscle mass is really um, important because in the elderly, if you lose 60% of your muscle mass, we know that this is a critical level because below this level, you're going to have a, a high level of morbidity and if by any chance you have any sort of sickness, 
critical illness, which is going to either increase the muscle, decrease your muscle mass, immobilize you, then death could occur very quickly in this elderly population. And this is seen very easily in the hip fracture patients or people who have a um, cardiac arrest. If you actually have to go into critical care, then you're going to then lose from the 60%, another 10 to 15% in the two weeks that you're in hospital. And this muscle mass is then at this stage, very difficult to recuperate. So maintaining muscle mass has become something which is very important, especially since the population of the world is, is becoming older. And we know that by two, the year 2050, there'll be 2,000, 2 billion people who are over 60 years of age and over two, 200 million people will actually be suffering from sarcopenia. And so sarcopenia has now been accepted by the Wealth Organ Health Organization and all the different organizations as being a real age-related illness. So the definition which we have now for sarcopenia is that sarcopenia, as by the European Sarp Sarcopenic Group's definition, is a progressive and generalized scheduled muscle uh, dis oops disorder and it involves the accelerated loss of muscle mass and function and it's associated with increased adverse outcomes including falls fractures disability and mortality oops ah. you can point to the errors on no, the I just can't. On... it won't move <laughs> i can't move on to... yes Click now. No. No. Oh. Oh. I'm afraid you have to interrupt uh, the presentation mode to ask or something to get out of there. Yeah. All right. It changed now. Okay. okay. <laughs> so sarcopenia, uh, as we all know, it's a very complex uh, etiology. And there's a large amount of research that's been done on sarcopenia over the years. So today I'm only giving you a very general outlook and won't go into all the different uh, factors which are involved in both the muscle loss and the muscle weakness, which characterizes sarcopenia. But with aging, what is obvious is we know that there's a really large decrease in all of the different circulating hormones, a decrease, decrease in testosterone, in androgens, in estrogens, in growth hormone and IGF-1. And these are very important in maintaining your muscle mass. There's also, uh, this is accompanied in the, during the, the time course with an increase in inflammation. So you get increases in circulating cytokines, TNF-alpha, IL-6, ILF-1 beta. We also know that this, all of this is accompanied by a change in the system, in the uh, innovation. So you're going to get motor neuron death and changes in the neuromuscular junction. This seems to be less um, a case in humans for the, the changes in the neuromuscular junction. But what we do know is that there, there is a progressive loss of fiber number. And this has been uh, a lot of anatomical studies have gone on. And if you actually look at the muscle fiber atrophy, this decrease in size of the single fibers and the, the size of the muscle, it's not only a decrease in the cross-sectional area of each of the fibers that can account for the muscle loss so that we know that motor neur neurons die and the fiber number progressively decreases with age, particularly a, a loss of the muscle fibers from 70 years onwards. We also know that there's a lot of lifestyle changes and that the sarcopenia and this loss of muscle mass and muscle weakness is associated with a different, as we get older, we're going to do less physical activity. We eat less well. And these are also going to uh, account for this loss of muscle mass. And this is a that malnutrition is a big uh, problem in the elderly elderly from 70 to 90 years onwards. Vitamin D deficiency is also associated with uh, this, uh, the quality of the muscle. So as you can see, it's very complex. And so we, I'll go back to the story of where I began first working on aging, which is uh, the MyoAge group. When we 
we wanted to look at healthy aging to really characterize in a European population, how do people age the same in different countries? And so we looked across countries from Scandinavia, right the way down to Italy, across Great Britain, France, and Finland. And we also wanted to, we wanted to look at healthy aging. So we eliminated people who had any chronic illness accompanying, because we know that chronic illness um, can also induce a loss of muscle mass. And what we wanted to look at was how are you healthily aging? Because this is something which is important to understand if you want to understand how chronic diseases or even neuromuscular diseases are going to have a a, an additional effect on the normal, the normal time course of how we're aging. So in our study, we looked at over 1,500 young and, and then elderly adults. So our, our adults aren't so elderly. In fact, we go from 70 to 80, 85 years. And what we have found by looking at that, so though people, as I said, each individual will age differently. So there's quite a large spread in how you will age. On an average, when you're looking at this group of 70 to 80 year olds, we found that the people, so we made, we looked at the way they walked. We found that they walked 25% slower than the younger. We found that they had more difficulty in rising. So there's a, a very simple test of, of a stand up and go. And we also found that if we looked at them and filmed them going up and down stairs, that progressively in this elderly group, they had a different pattern of movement and as a way of going up and down stairs compared to the young uh, population. When we look at the way that they can jump on a power plate, so we're measuring the, the force that they have in their muscles, we found that this was 40% lower in the elderly. And we found that leg strength was 42% lower in the elderly. <coughs> We then used MRI and DEXA to examine the mass, the lean muscle mass, the skeletal muscle mass and the bone size and fat accumulation in all of these groups of individuals. MRI revealed that older people had quadriceps muscles that were 28% smaller and that the older people, as you can see, showed an infiltration of connective tissue and adipose tissue. The DEXA showed us that there was a higher percentage of body fat in the old, meaning that you had smaller and weaker muscles, but they were having to do a, a, the same amount of work to do the daily activities. <coughs> so during the study, it was interesting because many people use DEXA to measure the lean muscle mass and lean muscle mass, the DEXA, you compare it to height. And we found that this showed that in the population, if we use the DEXA, there was only 5% of our participants, which we could classify as really being sarcopenic. And therefore with the uh, Jean-Yves Ogrel and uh, Pierre Carlier, we looked at the, the uh, uh, MRI and we normalized the muscle mass to the femur volume to be able to have a normalized index. And this gave us a much more accurate idea of what, how, what the muscle volume is in an individual. And by using this criteria, we found that 70% of older men and 50% of older women were now classified as having muscle loss and we could call them a sarcopenic. So the MRI gives you a much better um, quanti quantitation of muscle volume, but it is a technique which is fairly expensive. And so with Marco Narici, what we decided to do was to see if there was a much simpler way to be able to measure the index of muscle loss. And so we wanted to look at muscle architecture and we wanted to use a technique which was easily used at the bedside. And so we used ultrasound. And by ultrasound, you can actually see, look at the quality of the muscle. And but <coughs> if you take a muscle like the uh, vastus lateralis, it's very nice because you can look at the, how the muscle fibers, uh, the actual length of a muscle fascicle, and you can see the pination angle. And so this gives you an idea of how your muscle fibers are aligned within a muscle. And if you look at older muscle compared to the younger muscle, we found that the quality of this architecture change, we can measure the fascicle length and the pination angle. 
and we've just published that we can have an hour different and very cheap and in non-invasive and inexpensive technique and we've called this the ultrasound sarcopenic index and what you do is you measure the ratio of the fascicle length to the muscle thickness on the uh, on your image from the ultrasound image and this was correlated directly with the measures that we got using the MRI. So on the same individuals, we've done MRI and used the ultrasound. And this is now also independent of the sex, the body mass and the height. The only problem is this has only been done now for the vastus lateralis and will have to be done for other muscles. But it gives us a nice cheap way to be able to look at patients um, and elderly patients without having to go to MRI and have an idea of how severe is their loss of muscle. And as you can see here, it's really age related. So if we use this index <coughs> on the young, on moderately active elderly, on sedentary elderly, or on moderately immobili immobilized elderly, you can see that this index is significantly different. And so it gives us a nice index to class uh, our individuals into groups. And it gives us an idea of the, of the exact mass of muscle and the, the level of muscle atrophy. So although the, the other thing you get is we'd seen that there was a loss of muscle mass, but we also knew that you get a loss of muscle strength before you lose the muscle mass. And so to look for the quality, <coughs> to, we, want, we also look, looked at the specific force. So the specific force is the force which you now normalize to the size of your muscle. And if you do this in your group of young and elderly subjects, you find that for the same mass of muscle, muscles of older people are, intrin are intrinsically weaker, which explains that there is a lower quality of muscle in the elderly compared to the young. So you don't only, so this loss of uh, quality explains why you get a loss of force even before you get a loss of ma muscle mass in the elder in as during normal aging and this sort this sort of correlation you can see even uh, in from 60 60 years onwards in the subject so if you now want to see what is happening what is the quality what is changing in your skeletal muscle so if you look at the, an extract from muscle biopsies. What can explain some of this reduced muscle force, force is that if you can find a correlation between the loss of the muscle force and a decrease in the concentration of co both the contractile and costumeric proteins. So you lose for the same amount of muscle mass, you have much less contractile and uh, like myosin, heavy chains, actin, tropomyosin, and troponin and the costumeric proteins like FAC, vinculin and tennosin and which it, and so this will explain why some of the reason why you'll get you can for a same muscle mass you can also make less force. On these same muscle biopsies if you look older people you also find that if you look at the the contractile proteins, and then also then look at the mitochondrial proteins compared to the muscle mass, you find that older people have lower level of mito mitochondrial proteins compared to the younger group. And this is also accompanied, so we looked at the, all of the different complexes, and this is not only been done by our group, but this is part of the mitochondrial theory of muscle aging. So for the over the last 20 years, many of these studies have been done by, by many groups. We did it over the whole of our individuals. And this decrease in muscle proteins is a company is probably in part due to um, also ab, you get abnormalities in, in mitochondrial morphology, mitochondrial number, as well as the mitochondrial function. And this is very related. So if you look at all this, it's always related to the muscle mass. And there have now been several studies have been done on large groups of elderly individuals 
doing transcriptomic analysis. And one of the very first changes which comes out during age is deregulations in gene networks involved in mitochondrial processes. So when you're losing muscle mass, one of the first things that you can think of since, since we have much lower num amount of contractile proteins, mitochondrial proteins, we think that there must, the obvious thing to look at is protein synthesis and to see, is there a balance between protein synthesis and protein degradation? And protein degradation has two different pathways. So the pathways is ubiquitin proteasome system or the autophagic lysosomal system. And over the past 20 years, many studies have been done on humans in vivo, looking at protein synthesis levels. And what we find is that although protein synthesis levels are very similar in younger men and older men, if you look at, and in women, if you look at protein breakdown, there is always more protein breakdown in the elderly compared to the young, which would explain, which would point to the fact that there is a mismatch in the elderly between protein synthesis and degradation. And in our group and in many other groups, they've, we've looked at the different pathways which are involved in both protein synthesis and protein degradation to see how, which of these path, pathways are modified and which could be targets to be able to interfere with in order to maintain muscle mass and reverse the atrophy. And so what one of the things which we did was to look at myostatin, since many of the therapies which are being used are anti-myostatin therapies, and there are a number of studies been with different drugs which have blocked the myostatin in order to increase muscle mass. However, myostatin, interestingly, was not modified during age and in none of our studies and none and several other studies have been done now there is no increase in myostatin during healthy aging there is only an increase in myostatin in certain diseases where you get a chronic loss of muscle mass such as during cancer cancer cachexia um, in <clears throat> after cardiac failure so it's a completely different system um, for muscle loss when you get an increase in myostatin and it doesn't, in, doesn't occur during healthy aging and it doesn't occur either during muscle loss during uh, muscular dystrophy. And so blocking myostatin is, is not always a good approach to be able to have an intervention to block muscle atrophy. IGF signaling is decreased and this is something which is absolutely systematic and this will have a huge effect on protein synthesis. And IGF-1 is really uh, also um, a very good indicator as to how well somebody will, the people who age better and including the centenarians always keep a high level of the IGF-1, which is maintaining their muscle mass and a low level of IL-6. These two factors seem to go together. If you have a high level of IGF-1 and a low level of IL-6, you have a very good aging profile and you do not lose muscle mass. PGC1 is decreased, alpha is decreased, and this is one of the reasons during age, normal aging, and this can explain why you get a decrease in, um, in proliferation of, of the mitochondria and the mitochondria are not replaced so well. And there's also, a de so this is the mitochondria, the decrease in mitochondrial proteins and in mitochondria. We find an MRF1 and atrogen one which are two proteins involved in protein degradation are increased systematically during normal aging. We also find that there's accumulation of modified proteins, including the contractile proteins and modified and dying organelles in the elderly muscle. And this is because autophagy is decreased and autophagy is essential for cleaning up the muscle, getting rid of all of these modified proteins, removing all the organelles like the mitochondria, which are no longer functional. And if this process actually gets out of order, then you will lose muscle mass. The quality of the muscle will go down enormously. And this autophagy, we, we know that if you stimulate autophagy, 
you will then remove the organelles, remove the, these modified proteins, and you can increase the muscle mass. You'll decrease, you'll also decrease MRF1 and nitrogen and increase protein synthesis. So these are just some of the, the main, uh, and a lot of work has been done on mice. Uh, using different transgenic mice to try and find out if there are ways to reverse. Can we overexpress IGF-1? Yes, you, you do. You, if you overexpress IGF-1, you can completely inhibit sarcopenia. So it, mice models can be used, but I haven't gone into that. And there is a huge literature in all of these um, different pathways, PGC-1 alpha as well. So I, if anybody is interested, I can always give you more data and more references on all of this. So classically, if you're looking at the muscle, um, you compare an old muscle to a young. If you want to try and explain why you are losing, why you have smaller and weaker muscles, you find that there's an atrophy. So your muscle fibers are getting smaller. And this was particularly true for type two fibers in limb muscles, which were 20, which are about 30% smaller in the elderly. As I said, you get a loss of muscle fibers due to the loss of motor units. And this is very difficult to measure. And uh, there's a lot of work going on now to try and, <clears throat> try and uh, work out how you can calculate the loss of motor units. Um, there's also a decrease, uh, there is a decrease of capillary density in the elderly, but there's a complete coupling. You, the density of the capillaries will actually decrease with the size of the muscle fibers, but the coupling between capillary density and muscle size is maintained. One thing I, th I wanted you to keep in mind is that we everybody's always looking at limb muscles and not all muscles age in the same way. And in fact, you do lose enormously your the facial muscles. If you look at elderly people, one of the things you notice is the fact that their masseter muscles really almost have uh, really fade away and they have a lot of problems um, with chewing and if you look at the masseter muscle there's a you lose two-thirds of it by the time that by the time you're about 80 and and but in the in the masseter in fact there's there's a completely different um, change in fiber type because whereas in limb muscle you actually go to a, a slower um muscle phenotype, which means the, the muscles, uh, you're losing the type two fibers and your, your, your type, the fibers are going to a more slower phenotype. So you're getting a, a fiber type switch. In the masseter muscle, it's completely the opposite. You're losing the slow fibers and you're gaining fast. And since this muscle is very important in chewing, which is, and maintaining the, the, the jaw, we think one of the reasons you're getting a change in fiber type in the masseter muscle is because you're losing so much bone because you're actually losing bone density as well but this does lead to a problem in in for nutrition in the elderly so each muscle is different and uh, i we should get out get rid of the idea that uh, all muscles are like like limb muscles they're not you have many different muscles muscles in the face muscles in the in the eyelids and swallowing so all of these different muscles are going to behave differently during aging um, one of the questions that we asked, and I think it's important to ask, is how can we how can we combat the this loss of muscle mass, and how can we maintain a, a, a better quality and quantity of muscle as we in the elderly? And this is this is important. So exercise, we know up until now, is probably one of the best ways to combat the the loss of muscle mass and the loss of muscle force with age. And if you look here, so this is uh, two curves to show. The first is the, the untrained, which is more like people like, like, like us, I guess. So if you look at the untrained red, red curve, you'll see that you're gradually going to be losing muscle mass and muscle function. And if you look at the blue curve, this is the curve of people who are actually doing lifelong physical exercise. So, as I said, it's inevitable that we're all going to lose this muscle mass, but is there a way 
to be able to, so if you're looking at lifelong training makes you strength-wise 30 to 50 years younger. So going, if we want to get younger, what we should, what, what we should do is to keep active. But if we're already on the down slope, is there any way we can get back? And so studies of many studies have been done now where people have to try and find out if you do physical activity, can you actually get nearer to this blue curve and at which age? And in fact, many studies have been done even up to 80 years of age now where people in, have been uh, doing in particular resistance training in order to make the to, to sit, increase muscle mass. And in fact, you can. So if you do strength training, whatever the age, then you'll find that you can actually make your muscles younger. And exercise is good because it can reverse many of the uh, many of the of the factors which I which I've shown of uh, modified during the normal healthy aging process. So this is looking at so, oops, that was out of. So this is this is this was going back to my sarcopenic index. That if you look at that sarcopenic index using the ultrasound, and now you look to see can you can you actually get a better muscle architecture and better quality of muscle. So I've shown that if you do exercise, no matter what the age, you can increase the mass. And what if you look look at the sarcopenic index and the architecture, you find that if you do exercise, even in the elderly, the elderly the elderly get to increase a much better muscle ar architecture compared to the elderly frail. Not so far. Master athletes keep a much better ar architecture. So, health exercise will increase not only the quantity but the quality and the force production of the muscle. So exercise is really good for you. And there's been a proven, if, so, but this was a meta-analysis of different studies to look if strength training and strength training is probably one of the easiest things to be able to give to elderly individuals. And they've proved that you can really increase all of the, all of your, uh, they did chest presses, leg extension, leg presses, and all of these values were increased in the elderly after training. And another thing that training has been used now, and we know that exercise training in the elderly is good, because uh, it's come into general practice um, to do personalized ex exercise training prior to surgery, prior to hip surgery, and prior to knee surgery in, L, in the elderly individuals. And so a six weeks um, training sessions to increase the mass and increase the, the force of the muscles um, is really recommended. And this pre surgery exercise speeds up recovery and it limits the loss of muscle mass and it reduces pain. So it's very input. This is in an elderly hip. So elderly, hip, this is usually in groups of indiv individuals over 60 who are doing this. And this is very important. And uh, to, in order to, to get a much better recovery. And so you can exercise is really good, not only to counteract the loss of muscle mass, but also to to counteract if you're going to go into surgery, where surgery will lead to a much larger loss of muscle mass. Immediately, somebody will be put into bed and immobilized. In an LD individual, you will lose an enormous amount of muscle mass. And this is important to maintain and to not lose this muscle mass if you want to uh, keep get the individual back on their feet and to recover all the muscle mass and not lose a, a large percentage. So how does exercise combat this age-related muscle loss and age-related muscle weakness? By looking at the level of the <clears throat> circulating cytokines, such as IL-6, TNF-alpha, what we find is that the, you, will in, you will really decrease the level of inflammation um, by exercise. Exercise will also decrease the level of reactive oxygen species. And this is in much, very much important for the maintaining muscle mass. 
if you do exercise, you will find a significant increase in the levels of IGF-1 and in PGF-1 alpha. This will, of course, increase the protein synthesis, so you'll get an increased synthesis of contractile proteins. PGC-1 alpha is will normalize the, the uh, mitochondrial genesis, so you'll get a prolifer proliferation of mitochondria and um, an increased turnover of the mitochondria, and you get healthy mitochondrial. You'll also improve the architecture of your muscle. We also know that exercise will, will maintain neuromuscular junction morphology, probably by a feedback mechanism of, of maintaining levels of IGF-1. Exercise will also stimulate the autophagy, autophagy, which is important to maintain the muscle mass because it will, this will, do, will remove all of the damaged proteins and organelles. You will also increase capillary density. And the exercise will also have an effect by stimulating appetite and also stimulating motivation. So if you do exercise, you'll become motivated to eat. And this will also, of course, maintain the, your muscle mass. So all of this, you can see that combating sarcopenia and maintaining muscle mass is really a multiple phenomena. And by doing just a simple exercise, you actually influence most of the um, factors involved in the etiology of, the, uh, of losing muscle mass and muscle force. Another hormones, as I said, decrease normally during aging. And some work has been done to try and to, to see if hormone replacement therapy would improve uh, muscle mass and maintain the muscle mass and maintain muscle function. And in collaboration in our Myon Age network, we had um, a very interesting study done on twins. So this is a twin study where one of the twins was had hormone replacement therapy and was compared to her other twin who did not. So these are, um, <clears throat> and this was done in Finland. And what, what we found, what the um, Sariana Sipila found was that in fact, hormone replacement therapy was very, uh, was very efficient in maintaining muscle area, muscle mass, decreasing fat, and it improved function. The, the uh, hormone replacement su subjects had muscle, had much better muscle force, muscle power, and they could walk faster. And when they looked at the basis for this, what they find is if you if you look at these postmenopausal women who'd received the replacement therapy, you found that all of the IGF path, IGF-1 pathway had been normalized. An IGF-1 pathway and IGF-1 is at a level found in the younger in a younger individual. So hormone replacement therapy could be very efficient to maintain muscle mass and muscle function. So that muscle mass, what what we've looked at is looking really at the muscle itself, so at the muscle fiber, but skeletal muscle also contains satellite cells, which are the muscle stem cells. And we were interested to know. Since we know we, you not only lose muscle mass as you get older, but it's also been reported that in fact the muscle regeneration capacity is is lower as you get older. So we wanted to know if the muscle stem cell dysfunction dysfunction could be one of the causes of both muscle atrophy and a decrease in regeneration. So if you look at the Satellite cells are, are nice because on muscle sections, you can easily um, label them using specific markers like PAC7 or NCAM. And so you can count the number of these muscle satellite cells or muscle stem cells on, on the muscles during age. And we looked at different muscles. So whatever the muscle you look at, so we've looked, I'm showing you here biceps or masseter. And you find that if you compare younger adults to an older, an elderly, again, in the same age group, between, six, between 70 to 80, you find that there is a large increase, decrease in the number of satellite cells with age. And we, so we wanted to know also, is there a decrease in their function with age? <clears throat> and is, this, is there a decrease in, uh, in the signal? So we know that uh, this decrease in, um, number 
uh, could influence muscle regeneration. So we wanted to look at stem cells which were isolated from either young individuals or older individuals. And we wanted to see how they proliferated. So if you look on the left-hand side, you can see if we isolate the, the stem cells from young and elderly individuals, of course, by just looking at that, you see the elderly individuals, we had less stem cells than in the younger individuals. So if we want to compare them, we then had to purify them. So we, we had the same number of young and elderly cells. We then wanted to, can these cells still proliferate to be able to repair muscle? So we looked at the rate of the division and we looked at the number of cells which could be made. And we found that in fact, there is no change in proliferative potential of the muscle stem cells with age. So there are less of the cells, but they can proliferate just as well. We also looked at the differentiation. So do the cells still differentiate? Yes, they differentiated very well from the young and from the elderly. But there was one difference which was really striking and that what in the in vitro situation, we have a way to artificially look at the stem cell replacement. So we have what's called um, a pool uh, the, of cells which remain and do not fuse. And these are the, the pool which will make your <clears throat> muscle stem cells in the adult muscle. And although you can see this pool of reserve cells, which will make the, which are the stem cells <clears throat> which will replenish the pool in the young uh, population. If you look at the cells we isolated from the elderly subjects, it, there were very few of these, uh, these reserve cells which were present. And instead, the cells, the remaining uh, cells actually stayed as, undif as differentiated mononucleate cells. So the cells tended to differentiate and did not maintain a pool of reserve cells to remake a stem cell pool. And this is easily shown here. So if we look here, we see that the, the undifferentiated cells, instead of being reserve cells, are now differentiated mononuclear cells. So this would seem to say that in the elderly, if we're looking at the stem cells, there's an imbalance between quiescence and differentiation. So we then looked at these cells in more detail to try and understand what was happening. And if we first looked at the, the methylation of the DNA in the younger cells and the elderly cells, and what we found is that in the cells isolated from elderly, there was a hypomethylation of cells which are related to differentiation, but a hypermethylation of cells which were involved in, in cells going back to quiescent and renewing the stem cell pool. And in particular, we identified um, a protein called Sprouty1. And Sprouty1 with, is very much involved in, in making the stellar, the, maintain this, the stellar uh, quiescent stem cell. And Sprouty1 expression could be rescued if we demethylated the DNA, we could now rescue Sprouty1 expression. And in the same way, in young, we took the young cells from the young individuals, treated them with Sprouty1 siRNA to knock down Sprouty, and then we found that we could again, we, we could not re re replenish the pool of reserve cells, therefore proving that Sprouty1 is one of the factors involved in the this loss of, of stem cell characteristics. So what we can say is that there is a decrease in the number of, uh, of the stem cells, and this decrease can in, in some way be explained by the modification that we're seeing in the elderly satellite cells, which have become methylated. This methylation gives you, a, you get a methylation of the genes which will maintain the stem cell pool, whereas a, a hypomethylation of, ge of genes for differentiation, therefore the cells will then go, will fuse with the damaged muscle fibers. You won't replenish the pool of stem cells. And this will de in some ways explain some of the decrease you see in the number of, of stem cells in the elderly. So with age, you find a decrease in the number and the modification of the morphology. We now know, we can see easily, I think all of you have looked at muscle sections will see that your 
the, the satellite cells become ensconced within the, the muscle fiber and therefore they're much, much less accessible to be activated by any of the circulating factors. And this, as well as the modification in the epigenetics and this methylation of sprouted will explain why you get a much as a smaller number of less active satellite cells in the elderly and therefore this could limit both the regeneration and the maintenance of muscle mass. We also know that in the exercise, again exercise not only has effect on the muscle itself, but it also will increase the pool of the satellite cells by increasing the level of circulating factors. And, but it should be noted that in the studies which have been carried out by Michael Keir, it's quite interesting to know, again, that not all elderly are the same and some uh, elderly individuals are completely um, resistant to the effect of exercise and will not increase either the number of satellite cells, either the, all the strength or the muscle mass. And this, again, we need to understand, to be able to understand how we can really make interventions to improve muscle mass. So as you can see, muscle and aging, it's very complex. Uh, I've done a very brief overview to show what's going on. So as you can see, physical activity is really important. Growth factors, circulating growth factors, the innovation, there's nutritional changes, protein uptake, all of these different pathways will be involved. The immune system, the effect of inflammation, the increase of rock status stress, all of these factors, multifactorial, will have an effect by decreasing your muscle mass. You get decreased autophagy, you get increased insulin resistance. You also get an increase in apoptosis, increased protein breakdown. So this, is a very complex process, which in muscle disease, and that's one of the things I think is important to keep in mind, when you have a muscle disease, the muscle disease and the effect of your mutation will also be, a we will be imposed upon the normal effect of muscle aging. <coughs> so that's all I had to say today. <laughs> so, now we have to look for so keep active and keep eating <laughs> keeping eating healthily and i hope you'll age well so thank you thank you very much uh, Jillian. it was a very informative uh, talk and i personally learned a lot we currently have one question <laughs> by arno ferry uh, in the q a so arno if you want to unmute yourself you can voice your question because everybody is now able to unmute. Yes, thank you for this very nice uh, presentation, Jillian. Um, how can you explain uh, the increase in uh, muscle mass um, induced by exercise? Is it a decrease of uh, proteolysis? or uh, increase in uh, uh, synthesis of protein? It's first, you get first by an increase in protein synthesis, but it's very, it's very, you have to have a very holistic approach because if you do exercise, you're actually modifying a huge number of things because you're increasing protein synthesis, you're increasing PGC1 alpha, so you're increasing mitochondrial genesis, you're increasing autophagy. So it's again, maintaining this equilibrium and you're also increasing amino acid uptake. So in the, your increase in muscle mass is an increase in the, in, um, the synthesis in particular contractile proteins and a breakdown and a removal of all the, all of the modified proteins which accumulate. Thank you very much. So Jean-Yves O'Kell has a question as well. You can unmute yourself, Jean-Yves. Uh, yes. thank, thank you, Jill, for this very nice presentation and uh, this brilliant overview. Um, as you probably know, I've got a, a, a problem with the definition of sarcopenia. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because um, the definition should not, to my point of view, not include functional factors, because coming back to the uh, original definition, it was 
a loss of muscle mass. And by adding functional factors, we mix the cause and the consequences. What, what do you think about that? I think that too, but unfortunately the European the, have set the guidelines and this is because the, and they put frailty in and I think frailty should be out. I think that there should be uh, one, uh, there should be sarcopenia and then dyspenia. And I think it's it very difficult. I think we should, uh, I, it's very difficult to fight against this, but I agree with you. And I don't, uh, I think it's very difficult since they bought this uh, new um, definition. And especially since frailty and falls has come into it, it's my, and dementia even. So I think you're right. Thank you. But how do we fight against it, Jean-Yves? <laughs> <laughs> Because now it's it's all over this plate, you know. Every, every all of the aging meetings on sarcopenia, they put they put this European working groups definition up. Yeah, but I, I know that not all the people is uh, agree with this uh, definition, and the, I think the consensus is not uh, reached for no. uh, for everyone. <laughs> no, it's not reached. I think there's still room room out there for yeah. fighting against it. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> and thank you uh, for all of your work. <laughs> so I don't see questions in the queue, but uh, I may put one in the mid in the meantime, why while, while people gain the courage to ask you things. So it it's a very interesting for me the idea that uh, unlike what would be the first tendency that the atrophy of old age is reversible. So you think of atrophy as being reversible after you break a leg and you're a young person and you recover with a, a bit of exercise. But the idea that it can happen also in, in older people, it's probably more innovative. And uh, what are the limits and uh, the advantages of, of those um, exercises in older age? And how does that compare to uh, younger age? Well, I think prior to, prior with the exercise in general to, to be able to redo muscle mass, it's really important. There are many, many, many studies now done. So if you, you look in the literature, that it's, you can really maintain muscle mass, increase muscle mass, maintain muscle mass. The thing is, and in some countries like in Great Britain now, they actually, you can get a, um, a prescription for exercise mm -hmm. and in the States too. And so the thing is to define which exercise. And I think that the consensus is coming that it's more, you have to have a mixed exercise and that resistance exercise is probably giving more muscle mass. But if you do endurance, um, if you're looking at the mitochondria, they've reversed the transcriptome by doing 30 minutes brisk walking per day. <clears throat> That's not a lot, actually, mm -hmm. but it has to be 30. So I think it's in maintaining them. And if you're looking at levels of IGF-2 and things like that, and levels of ROS, all of these are improved by exercise. And Alzheimer's disease are now being treated by exercise too. So exercise is, is, is something which should really be given, become part of the um, a way of life, lifestyle, and should be given as prescription in, as in other countries, I think, because mm -hmm. it does maintain muscle mass. And I think the, the other thing that's interesting that you get from this is, is the fact that you can explain when people with muscle disease go off their feet, they, you, they lose so much of their muscle mass so quickly in those first few weeks. And I think, again, by looking at sarcopenia and ways to treat it, then I, I think we should look for ways to maintain muscle mass in muscle disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Uh, another thing that I wanted to ask was about your, you talked about hormone replacement therapy. I think that the people with most impressive muscle atrophy I've seen in my life are uh, ladies that are very thin and have a severe osteoporosis. And at the same time, they have a huge and diffuse muscle atrophy. 
So uh, in those cases, uh, do you think that um, the hormone therapy would be better to start with than exercise or not? You know, the, and even test, you know, people have been trying in Scandinavia even to use testosterone in the women and androgens to try and, to try and increase muscle mass. Um, if, you, if there's no myostat increase in myostatin, then the, I think hormone replacement therapy could really be uh, advantageous. The thing is in Europe, in, in the Scandinavian countries, it's still used, but I think in France, they abolished it because of the increased cancer risk. But in fact, mm -hmm. it doesn't have an increased cancer risk if you look at the Scandinavian studies. So I, I, I think it's certainly worth the risk if there's no increase in, in myostatin when you could inhibit myostatin. Excellent. So anyone else has questions? Well, if I may add a comment. Yep. Um, I think uh, also we should consider some social and economical factors. When the people are, are going to retirement, they earn less money and they can't, they can't afford buying a good steak every day. So I know that the protein uh, input should be increased, but for some economical reason, it can, it's not possible. So this has also to be uh, considered as a, as a burden for our elderly people. You know, that's really interesting because in the, uh, I just, I was working with some people, looking at some people in England, Sirius Cooper, and they've been doing nutritional studies in the elderly and um, how supermarket buying and how, how to re-equilibrate the diet of the elderly. And that's really important, they found, to try and find ways to, to increase protein input uh, on, ho on low income diets and how to rearrange supermarkets and have counseling for the elderly for um, high protein uh, frequent uh, meals. Mm. But that's quite true because they can't afford steak. But then in, in England, they've been looking for other replacements of, um, for steak. <laughs> so, Fauri Avamand has a question. Hi, Jill. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Hi Thank Anna. you. Hey, so nice to see you. You don't see me, but I'm really happy to see you. Oh, um, and thank you for this very nice uh, talk. It was uh, very comprehensive and I really enjoyed it. And I love the photographs at the end. Um, so when you said, and that's very true, that not all elderly people are the same and they obviously don't respond uh, in the same way. Do you know if there are any uh, genetic studies undergoing uh, to try and, you know, see if there is? And there must be a genetic factor that um, makes this difference. And uh, when you said, you know, not all elderly people respond the same to exercise. There are, are there polymorphisms, aren't there? Yeah. Um, exactly. Well, one of them is this, this uh, IGF-1 IL-6 ratio, which is a poly, it, nobody quite knows how it, but it, uh, how it's controlled, but the level of IGF-1 IL-6 is definitely something which is healthy, correlated with healthy aging. And okay. nobody knows, uh, some people at the group of Claudio Franceschi on the centenar centenarian study have been looking at that. And then another group which is looking for, genet for genetic factors is the Leiden Long Levity cohort. And so they're looking for uh, genetic, um, oh, what are they called? Uh, modifiers. Yep, Ge exactly. Genetic modifiers that could, might explain because they have one, two, three, there are four generations now of, of uh, families that they're looking at and their spouses. And they're going through this to look to see what it, what is involved with healthy the, in the long levity and, to, and what's environment and what's not. And they found out that also, if you're living with somebody who's long lived, you tend to have a, a better chance of living longer mm -hmm. in this long levity study. So this, it's quite interesting because it's definitely inherited. Some of the factors inherited and some of the factors are also due to environment. So it's yeah. the light and long levity study. That makes sense. And just a comment, um, I actually noticed that in Sweden, you know, elderly people are outside a lot, even when they have to use crutches and, you know, so I've definitely noticed a cultural 
a difference between France and Sweden. And that's very interesting to see. And I think, you know, they age better here, at, at least in, in, you know, uh, talking about mobility and uh, they're much more active here. Yeah, they're, le they're less sedentary and, and they've done a lot of studies on that because if you look at people, even when people go into what they call care, they actually are doing a lot of exercise. And if you measure the amount of exercise done by Scandinavians per day, it's much, much higher than in France where people are sedentary. And elderly, you tend not to date them out at all. Once people go into a, an, a, a, a senior residence, then they don't go out. There's no exercise. Whereas in Scandinavia, they actually have to do exercise. It's, it's compulsory within the institution. Yeah, and I think, it, you know, one of the reasons also is daylight you know as soon as there's a ray of sunshine here everyone is outside young and elderly so that's you know that's their incentive as well mm. oh it's true okay yep. well it was really nice listening to you <laughs> thank you wish we'd see you someday <laughs> well yeah this summer <laughs> okay so we are a bit longer, but we have other questions in line. Uh, I think we are going to allow them. What do you think, Thierry? Yeah. So, so Jan Verschuren, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Do you? Thank you. Yeah, I was wondering uh, how specific the mechanisms of aging are for muscle. And for example, other organs like skin, has it been shown or studied if there's similar mechanisms, similar prediction from these organs like the skin, or is it very different? Well, I think you have differences with post mit with cell with the organs which are post mitotic, like the muscle, mm -hmm. and organs which like the skin, uh, which are rapidly turning over. So you tend to have cellular senescence in the skin, which you don't have in the in the muscle. So there are two. There are different mechanisms in 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 the two different organs, but they will all be affected by these growth, the circulating factors, which have a a big um, uh, game to play, I think, in 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 uh, in aging. Yeah. So I think, and yeah. ROS, I mean, all, everything like the inflammation, the ROS, all of these things are going to affect the skin and the muscle, which is why it's such a comp. Aging is such a complex process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly. Well, thank and you very much. I and that's why exercise will have an effect on the skin because it increases all of the the different circulating factors. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, Alfredo Walpers, do you want yes. to unmute yes. yourself? Yes. Thank hello. You. hello. Thank you for your presentation, Julian. I just have a question. You mentioned that um, that the pattern of 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 aging or sarcopenia is different in different muscles, or at least in the limb muscles. I was wondering if it does it make sense, for instance, during a study say by MRI, which is on what I work on, does it make sense to look at several muscles, for instance, the, the quadriceps, the calves, the forearm, or should you just look at, at one privileged muscle? Because I think I just showed some MRI image, images, but they were on the on the quadriceps. Yeah, I think we everybody's working on on the limb muscles, and I think I. Th and then what you find is that muscles will age differently and people never look. I mean, I was looking at the face muscles because you use the face facial muscles all the time. So they're not really affected by disuse. And yet you still lose so much of that muscle mass and not, not many people have looked at the masseter muscle, I think. And I, I think it's a very important muscle. And the other muscle which really gets thins out during aging is the diaphragm. These two muscles are, are poorly studied muscles, I find, and they're both affected by aging, even though they're continually used. And in different ways. So last question, Arno Ferry. Thank you. Gillian, do the reduced level of uh, estrogen could play a role in uh, muscle we weakness in, in old uh, women? Yes. Hello? Really? Yes. It seems that it must do, because if you if you if you if you normalize your hormone levels, you get you you get really? mass back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Julian. I think that the amount of questions and the discussion shows that 
both your talk was very uh, stimulating and people kept interested all the time and that's the best thing we can say about it i think <laughs> thank you very much it was very pleasant to to listen to you and learn with you thank you and thank you, thanks everybody thank you for inviting me thank, thank you. you bye thank you bye everyone